spoke with reporters about his goals as the new head of the 1.6 million member union. Mr. Kerry is 55. He spent most of his union career as president of a Teamsters local in New York. Good morning. Good morning. Are all the teamers running? You all know Teamster President Ron Carey. Well, if you don't, here I am. Ron Carey, how are you folks? Welcome. Well, I'd like to uh, open this up by saying uh, it certainly is the new Teamster position to uh, talk to the press as much as possible, to try to get out there, let you know what the problems are here, our side of the story, and to try to let uh, the members know the direction that this union is heading. And I can tell you that uh, after 72 hours, uh, I certainly uh, don't know all the answers, uh, and so certainly won't be trying to respond to all of the questions because as you know I don't have all of the answers only after a 72 hour period. So I thought what I'd do is uh, say I'm very excited about this challenge. Uh, I think the membership has indicated that. Uh, uh, very excited about trying to work with the leadership throughout the country uh, including people in which has been a major problem within the union. A union that now includes people that now works in the interests of the members and on top of which, uh, try to get our reputation pack back, dig into that corruption problem, and let's get rid of it for once and for all. Look at some of the contracts. For example, we have the uh, car hall contract, which is uh, almost a year in negotiating. Develop some new strategies. Uh, uh, look at uh, the negotiating arena in a whole different light. Uh, one built with education, uh, communicating with our members, and then developing some ideas to get the attention of the industry. And so with that, I think it uh, might be best to just uh, open the floor for any questions that you may have. Ron, on the subject of negotiations, um, uh, you have been asked, I think, by Yellow Freight, for instance, to reopen the National Master Freight Agreement to discuss the possibilities of a regional national contract. Uh, what is your view about that? Uh, is it a good idea? Do you intend to, uh, to talk with Yellow and other regional carriers? Well, I can... They may have asked, uh, in my view, the old Teamsters to reopen the agreement. Uh, we met with Yellow Freight yesterday, uh, some of myself and some of the vice presidents, uh, for an educational process about their business. And as a result, they mentioned that uh, they were looking to get involved in another kind of business, which is this regional carrier concept. And as a result of that, uh, look, we're always looking to... Uh, uh, to keep our ears open and always uh, willing to talk. Uh, the contract has not been reopened, no dates have been set, and I think it's important before we do any of those things to consult with our membership. And that's what I will be doing. Yes, sir. What plans do you have to uh, stand the membership decline in the freight division? I think that goes back to the whole issue of the our dignity, our respect, uh, the services we provide. How do we go out and organize the unorganized, uh, and there are many non-union freight companies out there, without having something to offer non-union people? And what we have to do is to show our members first, uh, produce the kinds of contracts uh, that our members can have some pride in, if you will and have a feeling that the union is working for them. Get out there and do the things we have to get done in the pension programs. When we have those kind of achievements, 
then I think you hear non-union people say it pays to belong to the Teamsters. And that's what the new Teamsters is all about, and that's certainly what I'll be working for. Yes, sir. Mr. Kerry, one of your uh, pledges upon taking office was to rid the Teamsters of any mob influence whatsoever. What specific measures are you going to take to rid the Teamsters of uh, that image that has been on for some time? After 72 hours and after I guess it's almost 88 year period of uh, problems, this is the first time there's ever been an election in the Teamsters, a direct election involvement by the rank and file. And I think one of the things that was so important to them was the fact of the corruption, the image, the fact that we lose our respect, our collective strength in the bargaining arena. And as a result of that, corruption is a major issue. First, we have to find out where it's at. The first thing we have to do as a union is to set up an ethics committee. That ethics committee will have some uh, investigating process. Uh, you must keep in mind all the while you have the government in this union. And they have their own responsibilities. And the one thing we don't want is a duplication of that. Now, the corruption problem, as I indicated, has been here for many years. What we have to do is put this ethics committee into place and to start to get it to work. More importantly is to send the right signals right from the very top that it's over and that it won't be tolerated by this administration. And anything that uh, comes to my attention, and we're going to try to set out a communication system so that we know what's going on. And if, in fact, there is any acts of corruption, they will be investigated. Those people who uh, are not willing to work hard, not willing to be honest, they won't be a part of the new Teamster Union. And that's been the problem. Things have been swept under the carpet with an ethics committee in there and with a president who has the courage to get in there and, and, and get it out. Would, I think that's the way you have to run this union, and that's certainly the way I will. What, uh, Mr. Kerry, what place will Jimmy Hoffa have in the new Teamsters? I mean, for example, is Pictures still be in the uh, building? Uh, will he still be considered the, uh, the founder, the great president? Well, I haven't talked much about the maintenance uh, part of the building. Uh, uh, I'm really more concerned about the things that are really important. For example, let's, let's get going. For example, right now, we are sitting down with some folks upstairs trying to sell the planes. Right now, we're in the process of getting rid of the limousines. Right now, we're in the process of looking as to how we cut waste, how we cut duplication, uh, how we can make this union not run as a bureaucracy, but run as a union that's going to work for the members. And, and as far as uh, Jimmy Hopper is concerned, he's on the wall, but uh, uh, we'll have to look down the road and see if he deserves that place. Mr. Kerry, uh, where are you going to try to lead the membership <coughs> in this election year? Tom Harkins is about the only candidate who's been talking about unions. Nobody's talked about the uh, replacement worker bill. What are you planning to do? How do you size up what's going on? What do you want to see happen? Last night, uh, uh, there was a reception for me that was put on by a nice group of trade unionists, and we, we talked a little bit about that problem. I, I think you have to keep in mind that for two and a half years I've been running around the country trying to get elected as general president. Haven't had the time to sit down and to focus on the candidates that are running. But one of the things I think is most important, if we are going to get behind a candidate, what we have to do is to make sure that that is a concerted effort that we're all operating in the same direction, that we're putting the resources behind us, and making sure that we're using the network. I mean, just think about the net. I got elected on a network of people who believed that they need a union that's going to work for them. Now, I just can visualize that in terms of a presidential election, if the unions got together, if they were out there, and they were networking it. That's why it's important that some major decisions have to be made about the candidates, the Democratic candidates, by the way, uh, hopefully by the end of February, so that we can get to work trying to get our folks in there.
Do your members be involved in some sort of endorsement process? Will you uh, survey your members? Yes, we will. And, and, and but I think doing a survey, you can figure out, the survey er can figure out what answers he wants answered. I think what we have to do is we have to tell our members about how in the hell a thing like worker replacement should be on the books and how this is being used I think I read an article just recently 80 percent of the employees if asked would use worker replacement as a way to win a strike we don't have an even playing field it's unfair it's wrong and what we have to do is in our surveys is show our members what that means show what it means about a national health insurance and how vitally important it is. You cannot negotiate these kinds of conditions across the bargaining table. I'll give you one example. The estimates that we started out with somewhere around $328. Uh, that would be over a three-year period, is going up to $500 per purse per family for a health package. Now, that's incredible. How do we negotiate that at the bargaining table? What do we do? Put the wages in the background? So the fact of the matter is our members have to be educated about the issues that are important to them. And where did those legislators, where did those politicians sit on those issues? What did they vote for? I think that way you get an accurate reading. Mr. Curry, have you been contacted by the administration at all since you took office? And could you also comment on the, um, the bad rap the American workers have been getting from the Japanese and so forth? Yes. Uh, I'll take the last question first. Uh, and that was, in my view, it's wrong. Uh, it shows in my, uh, from the way I look at it, I'm angry about that. And I think American workers have been taking a beating. I mean, look, if they're given the technology to, to produce the result, my travels around the country have clearly indicated that our folks do a, a fantastic job. I've been in and out of bonds, met thousands of Teamsters. In those meetings, I've met folks in other labor organizations. I didn't see people laying down. I didn't see lazy people, illiterate people. What I saw was people trying to produce a good result for their employer. I'm angry about those comments. I think they're wrong, and I think that... Uh, uh, the distance involved, they ought to come over. Come to some of the bonds with Ron Carey. My first night after, I think it was the first day I was in office, I went down to one of the job locations, and I talked to some of the members down there. I said, I didn't just come down here because I was looking for your vote then. I'm back now to let you know I appreciate it and still want to hear from you. And I think, I think the American people are angry. And a, an interesting thing is, I think one of the, major, the CEO of the Toyota uh, um, automobile company, who happens to be Japanese, is incensed about that comment as well. Now, getting back to the administration, I have uh, not had any contact with the administration. I can tell you that last evening, I met a real good bunch of folks, some senators and people over at the Hyatt at this reception. And uh, again, I think we have to look at the issues and we have to make sure that the folks that we vote for uh, are our friends and stop rewarding our enemies. Great. Yes, sir. You mentioned the, uh, the government before and your continued involvement in the union. How long do you think that will last or what steps will you take to remove the government from supervising the union? I think RICO, uh, I mean, the, the settlement agreement provides for them to be there forever. And I think uh, what we have to do is to show not only our members, and I think that's vital because that's what this union is about, our members first. We have to show the public, we have to show the government that we have what it takes uh, to, to get them out and to keep them out. And I think once we're able to do that, I think we can persuade them to leave. The, uh, yes, sir. The trucking industry, by most people's account, is not exactly rolling in cash. Uh, do you view the, trucking, the state of the trucking industry as management says, and uh, what does that mean for your ability to negotiate contracts if the freight agreement isn't open until 94? And a second question to that, most economists are predicting slow growth the next five years, very moderate growth. 
What does that mean to your ability to really extract wage concessions, or wage gains, rather? I'm not a great believer in concessions, because I don't see where concessions really get us anywhere. And I mean, I think folks look at a union because they're looking for gains. They're looking to be moving in the right direction, not irresponsibly either. But I'd like to go back to that point. If there are problems in the trucking industry, why is it that there's been a tremendous growth of non-union carriers? So I say to you, I don't believe that. And it's my opinion that what we have to do as a union is get out there, organize those non-union carriers. I think that provides an answer to some of the questions about competition, which I've heard from my father who heard from his father. So the word competition is sometimes a negotiating strategy. Uh, I don't believe the trucking industry is in bad shape. I spoke to the folks who came here yesterday to present their side of the story about yellow freight. It was an it a, it informational uh, report, and they just wanted us to know about it. It did not indicate that they indeed were in trouble. So I think we have to look at the freight industry, we have to look at the trucking industry, and we have to come up with some strategies that, that can help us... Uh, uh, and at the same time, take a responsible position. You spoke earlier about uh, national health insurance. Yes. Um, could you speak a little more specifically about what you'd like to see in health care reform? Well, as I indicated before, I think uh, an increase of almost uh, 1980, I think the numbers were something like uh, $250 billion. In 1990, the figures were $657 billion. Uh, that tells us there's a real serious problem in terms of health care. We're not getting any better care for it. Our members are not getting better care. We're just paying more for it. So I think we have to think about some program, and there are a number of them out there. They're the single-payer approach, and there's one being thought about today. Uh, we have to think about the 34 million and the fact that in some way we're paying for that. And we think it's important. I don't have all the answers on that. Looking at a whole host of things, I wish I could give you a specific response about a specific plan. But I assure you, down the road, I will be doing that. Mr. Carey, you said a lot of things were swept under the carpet. You said that earlier. And then you also talked about the um, planes and the uh, limos. Any, any surprises underneath that carpet in the last time you Well, it, there was one surprise. We also found a condominium in Puerto Rico. And that's, uh, that's on the market as of, I, I believe it was Monday morning. And I'm sure there'll be a lot more surprises in terms of uh, how we can restructure the union and make it work more efficiently. And why is it important to get rid of those items? Well, I don't think, I don't think we need them. I don't think that's efficient. Uh, I don't know that we're, in the, that we're in the rental business or whatever we're doing down in Puerto Rico. I don't believe that... Uh, that it makes sense. For example, I have to go to, I think I, there was a meeting scheduled for Puerto Rico and they had what they call the trades division down there and I think the cost to send me and to send two or three folks with me was about $2,500 round trip. And then we said, now let's do a real quick analysis. What would it cost to send the plane down? $8,000 just doesn't make sense to operate a union like that. And I think it sends out the wrong signals. Now, we can only sell the second plane, the first one. We think we're making some progress upstairs. And the second one, when the market price is right, I certainly don't want to be criticized for selling it. By the way, is there anyone interested in buying a plane? <laughs> are you saying there are Teamster assets out there that you don't know about that you have to unearth, so to speak? That may very well be. And that's what we're in the process of doing. We've got a team of people that are in there looking at a whole host of things. Mr. Carey, you have an idea. Uh, and, and when you said swept under the carpet, I'm not quite sure I, I know you in what. That. Yeah, but I didn't know in what context and in, on what subject. I was basically asking if there were any other surprises in no. the past 72 hours. No. But I'm sure if you ask that question two or three weeks from now, I'll have quite a few things to say. Do you have any idea how many reform candidates have been elected uh, at the local level? And in that regard, how, how much obstacle do you expect in implementing your new reform? Well, I don't have the number. I know there's been a few. Uh, uh, the question was raised uh, 
about a local in New York that had uh, some serious problems. And uh, I, I went out there right after the election and I campaigned for those folks in New York. It was a group that was trying to, as I put it, get the, some of the cast of characters out. Uh, they brought in some heavy guns to, I don't mean literally physical guns, <laughs> but they brought some folks in there that, uh, that were trying to put it back the way it was. And the result was we won the election. Uh, they refused to move out of the local union. I mean, this is the mentality. And the, uh, I had conversations with Bill McCarthy, and finally, uh, with the threat of uh, bringing the marshals in, they finally moved out. The new people have just taken over. Now, that's happened in New York, and I, I think that's the right signals. Uh, there was another local, not quite... Uh, mob influence, but there was a local in uh, Seattle, Washington, the same has taken place. Now, it is not my position, obviously, to exclude people. I've made that very clear. I want to work with the people. There's a lot of good, hard-working union officers out there. Honest, care about this union, and have a lot to contribute. And what I will do is to try to work with them, and to try to bring them in and get the best out of them. I've talked to some folks in this building, and you'd be surprised some of the ideas I'm just getting just talking to people. I went up to the lunchroom, and I sat down with two folks who worked in the clerical department, and, uh, and the things I began to hear about, so eager to start getting some teamwork in this building. So the biggest thing is cutting through all the red tape and get it to function properly. Yeah, Mr. Carey. Yes, sir. You, um, you have a lot on your plate right now. You've been talking about the um, yeah, uh, about cleaning up the image of the union and, 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 and getting rid of, of, of the corruption, about organizing new members in, in, um, in the trucking industry, organizing new members elsewhere, and maintaining and improving the contracts you have. How would you rank all those things in order of priority? What's most important of right now? Well, I think getting back the trust and I, th I think the respect of all members, <laughs> that's number one. That puts us... Uh, really on a springboard for organizing. Now, I guess you have, before that, you're right, number one has to be the corruption problem. Has to be, that has to be the priority. And second has to be the respect of the members. Once you're able to gain back their respect, you get their, you get their confidence and support bargaining, you get them out on the road, you get them in the airlines, for example, in Northwest, you get people proudly putting their teams to pin on with the plane. And what we've done there, even before I was elected, was, I think, a major achievement. Uh, for example, addressing the members' needs. In the Northwest situation, we had six local unions representing the Northwest flight attendants. Uh, so in theory, what we had, we, we had folks that didn't know what flight attendant problems were, didn't sit at the bargaining table, may have represented a cop or a fireman or a truck driver. There's an example of taking a, a problem and reducing it and making it work. We are now giving them their own local union with their own elected representatives, with their own folks who will be doing the bargaining and taking 80% of the dues and leaving it in the local union. Whereas when you look at some of the other labor organizations out there, they don't do that. It's just the opposite. They take 80% out. So those are the things. Now, you can imagine the six local unions throughout the country who are now saying, I've lost a lot of people. And what about that, Ron? Well, there is a raid going on there, and it seems to me it's, the, it's common sense. It's not complicated. Just try to do the right thing, and that's what we've been able to do. So we started a new local called 2000. What kind of relations do you have with other unions, the AFL, CIO, the rest of the trade union movement? And uh, are you expanding that? To look to expand it in any way? Or? Absolutely. I think if you ask Peter from the New York Times, he was at the function last evening, and I think that uh, there was a good uh, array of people from the AFL, CIO. They know where I stand on the Article 20s and the raids. I think that's ridiculous. 85% of the working folks in this country are non-union. Why in the world would people be raiding one another? I don't understand that. And so the new Teamsters will, if there is organization going on out there, and there certainly will be, that will be a priority, it will be for non-union people, not raiding other locals. And uh, I've assured Lane Kirkland of that. He was there last evening, Tom Kirkland, I mean, Tom Donahue. 
And uh, that's been the thing, the practice I've worked under for years in Local 804 back in New York. Harry, the uh, Teamsters have long been opposed to uh, economic deregulation of the trucking industry, and now that the White House is proposing its budget to further deregulate mm -hmm. the industry, where do you stand on this issue? I'm not excited about that at all. And I think just pure, simple mathematics tells us deregulation hasn't done anything for us. In fact, at the meeting yesterday, uh, when deregulation came into the picture, in fact, what it did was create an uncompetitive position for many of the trucking firms in this country. And it not only did that, you folks fly around the country, how many major airlines are left? Every day we read and hear about more problems. So I'm not in favor of deregulation. It hasn't done anything for, for, for this industry and certainly hasn't done anything for the airline industry. Mr. Chair, you said that uh, you, you're cooperating more with the other unions and Mr. Kirkland. Uh, do you think it's more likely this year that you would seek to endorse a candidate uh, in consort with the other unions so that you can deliver uh, a bigger punch on, uh, on election day than uh, in the past rather than having canceled out votes uh, you could actually deliver uh, a stronger uh, pants, union message? Absolutely right and in fact that has to be the strategy if we're going to get a candidate that has a chance to win and the way we have to do that is to put all of our resources on a consistent basis uh, network that and get behind one candidate uh, who's going to, to treat labor fair. Can there be any discussions with other union leaders about how you would go about coming up with uh, maybe a, a, a unified endorsement? Yes, there was a discussion <coughs> while uh, I had a, a, a Coca-Cola last night along with the uh, 7-Up that Lane Kirkland was having and we talked about how important it was that we don't have any fragmentation here, that we indeed get a consistent approach to make sure that we get behind one candidate and don't have locals running all over the country dividing our resources. So yes, that, I hope that is the final result and I'll do my very best on that council uh, uh, to try to bring that about. Are there any candidates you yes, want to rule out? Um, I haven't uh, looked at them all Pat yet. Pat Buchanan, for example? Uh, well, I, I, I wouldn't be in that direction, even though that was part of the, the campaign strategy of, of my opponents. Uh, clearly, he's not, uh, he's not one of the folks that we'd be... Uh, and, and among the Democrats, is there, are, are there any who would just, just won't work? Peter, I really haven't analyzed all of their positions, and I think it would be unfair for me to, to make any comments Is at President this point. Bush clearly out of the realm Absolutely. <coughs> what is the best man for the union? I just want to go around and make sure I catch everyone. Did someone have a... I'm going over here with the master uh, Nope, I'm going to get back here. You had a shot. I, I was just going to follow up. What if the best person for, for unions is someone who may not win. I mean, do you want to endorse someone, a winner, or do you want to endorse somebody who will do best by you? God, that's a perfect world. I, I wish I had the answer to that. I think we have to take a position, and I think we have to let working people know in this country, and I've gone to meetings where I've heard people say, well, I'm a conservative Republican, and I'm this, and I'm that, and then when you start talking about the issues and how that has an effect upon their lives, and it's not them, because a union is a family. It's about how the children go to school. It's about their health care. It's about their whole quality of life, their pension programs. And when you start exploring these things, I think what happens is most people will say, that's an interesting point that I never looked at. And so what we have to do is even if we lack, and I hope that isn't so because I think this might send the wrong signals, we're going to try to get behind a winner. Let me leave it at that. Yes, sir. I'll be right back. Two questions. One, the 2.5 percent uh, in the current freight agreement, is that a target that you're going to look for in 94? Uh, secondly, are you going to reorganize your Washington office to do things different in any way? And is there any legislation besides striker replacement, which you've mentioned, that you're looking at? We are looking at a whole host of things that affect working people in this country. And I think that <coughs> our voice has not been as loud and has been as forceful as it should have been. 
And I'm certainly going to be looking into that area to see what we can do and see where our PAC dollars are being spent and make sure that we're supporting the people who support us. I mean, we've supported folks, the Reagan, Reagan, Bush era, and I ask you, what have we got in return? Uh, the first part of the question I didn't quite hear. The 2.5% wage step increase in the um, current freight agreement, are you looking at something like that in, nine, in the next freight agreement? And also, I think 10% of the trucking industry is Teamsters now. Are you setting a goal? Have you set a goal, 15, 20% by X year? Anything to that effect? Well, we, First of all, with respect to the freight agreement, I think it would be very premature to, to say what we'd be looking at there. In fact, I might say that I'm not satisfied with the freight agreement that was settled, and I think we could have done better. Uh, but having said that, uh, obviously, we'll, the whole purpose of my election was to do better, and that's what I intend to do. Now, regarding organizing, there is no way uh, that we can keep this competition argument on the same level when we have just literally hundreds of non-union folks out there that given the opportunity to have a union that will work for them, that a union that's working for them, that's, that is clean and honest and provides services, that we can't organize them. So yes, we do have some great plans in terms of organizing. As you know, and I know, we have organizers that are on there who don't organize. It's just another job, and it's just another paycheck. And that era is gone. We ju it's just too important. We cannot exist unless we get out there organizing, unless we, we provide a service, and we have at least some respect from the membership. It, do you intend... I'm going right over here, because he had... Okay. Yes, sir. Telephone question, sir. Mr. Carey? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I'm wondering if you can speak more specifically about your ethics committee and what you hope to accomplish with that. Well, I can probably uh, say get the bums out might be the best way of responding to that. Uh, but I think what we have to do, it, it, should, it, it will be an investigation uh, s group of people. It will uh, operate impartially and independently of my office and uh, it will root out the problems, uh, corruptions of many sorts. A, for example, the mob influence and uh, things like uh, membership not being treated fairly on, on certain grievance panels, which, by the way, we're now in the process of doing. But I think the whole question of uh, improper conduct, uh, corruption, those will be the basic components of, of that committee. Can we and one more question? Oh, yes, I just wondered if... Um, <laughs> well, he's not listening. <laughs> Go right ahead. All right, thank you. Do you believe that American companies have a moral obligation to hire American workers rather than chase the cheapest wages around the, around the world? Uh, absolutely. I think there's an obligation, and I'm frightened by what I hear about uh, uh, the Mexican free trade. I think... Uh, we have to look at that. We have to look at what uh, the Canadian free trade has brought about. And I think it's just another example of, uh, of exploiting American workers and exploiting Mexican workers, uh, more profits, and, and things of that nature. Thank you. One Thank you. Here. Yes, sir. On the financial condition of the organization, considering the loss of membership over the last decade? I'm sorry. Can you comment on the financial, consider, the financial condition of the organization considering the loss of membership over the last decade and, and more? I think it's, uh, it's been critical and no one has addressed themselves to that. Uh, there is no doubt there are, uh, there are some problems, but looking at the restructuring. For example, uh, I think uh, basically general executive board meetings are held in, in, in luxury settings around the country. Uh, just having the general executive board meetings either in Washington, uh, here where we're able to do the business at hand, and in maybe in some of the conferences around the country within their buildings saves literally millions of dollars. I mean, it, it is just incredible. So there's a whole host of things we think we can do 
to try to somehow repair the damage. Get our organizing folks out there, organizers who are organizing, folks who are going to be held accountable. And I've said to some of our vice presidents who get $75,000, look, let's get it straight. There is no free ride. Everyone here is going to have a job. Everyone here is going to have uh, accountability and answerability. And that's what the new Teamsters is all about. Thank you. Will you move to uh, reduce your own salary, be re repeated elsewhere on, on other levels? Uh, I can't force people to do that. I spoke to someone the other day, said, I, I just don't want that kind of money. And I, I said, well, you could put it back into your own local union. Uh, so I, am, I do have some constraints on the Constitution. I can't force that move. But I think when we send the right signals down and, hey, this is a union for the members. This isn't a country club. And it's over. And I want to thank all you folks very much. And I appreciate it. And I'll be talking to you a whole lot more specifically in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Join us Friday night at 6.10 p.m. Eastern Time, 3.10 Pacific, for a live viewer call-in program. Our guest will be Republican presidential candidate Patrick Buchanan. He will take your questions and comments about his presidential campaign. That's Friday night at 6.10 p.m. Eastern Time, 3.10 for our West Coast viewers. Coming up next here on C-SPAN, we bring you Senate floor debate on President Bush's economic plan. C-SPAN, the cable satellite public affairs network, and its companion network, C-SPAN 2,